So we want to welcome you again to prayer meeting tonight, and this is July the uh, 13th of 2022. And tonight we're going to begin by talking a little bit about the sloth. Now the sloth is a mammal, and it's noted for its slowness of movement. They spend most of their lives hanging upside down in trees in the rainforest, the tropical rainforest of Central America and South America. Sloths are so named because of their very low metabolism and their deliberate movements. Sloth, the word sloth, is relative to slow, literally means laziness. And their common name in several other languages simply means lazy or something similar. Their slowness of metabolism, and here's another picture of a sloth. They're cute, aren't they? They have a, just a loveliness to them. But um, their slowness permits their low-energy diet of leaves and avoids detection by predatory hawks and cats that hunt by sight. And so here you see a, a sloth, and he's eating some leaves. Sloths are almost helpless when they get on the ground, but interestingly, they're good swimmers. They have a shaggy coat with grooved hair that is host to a symbiotic green algae, which helps to camouflage the animal in the trees and provide it nutrients. It actually eats the algae that grows on it. But the algae also nu uh, uh, nourishes the sloth moth. There are moths that are special species of moths which exist solely on the sloth. Some of the sloths, like the three-toed sloth, go to the ground about once a week to urinate and defecate. And they dig a hole, sort of like a little cat hole, and then they cover it up. And that's the sloth, just a little bit about. It. But the sloth in our language is the lazy in other languages. And here we see a, a, a title slide. It's, it's simply entitled, Laziness, the Curse of Mankind. Laziness, the Curse of Mankind. Now, when, when I was a young man, uh, maybe an older boy, young man, whatever you want to call it, when I was a teenager growing up, I, I had a problem of wanting to be lazy. Now, fortunately, I had a father who didn't allow me to practice that very much. Uh, he was quite a hard worker, and he demanded uh, equal work from us most of the time. And so we weren't allowed to demonstrate, if you please, or exhibit our laziness. But in attitude, I wasn't one who really liked work very much. But uh, idleness, laziness, slothfulness, um, being a sluggard, the Bible condemns this with no mincing of words. And maybe you've heard the expression, uh, idleness is the devil's workshop. And another phrase says, idleness is the parent of all vice. But laziness or unproductiveness is the same thing as work is hallowed by God's working. Idleness is regarded as a sin against oneself and society. We need to understand that in the beginning, when God created the Garden of Eden, created man, all the animals, that he gave Adam work to do. Adam wasn't to be someone who didn't work. In the Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, if we could turn to Genesis 2.15, we have here the slide on the screen for those who can, but it says, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Now, the word that we translate keep here in this verse is a Hebrew word, um, shamar, and it means to maintain. But the word that we translate dress, it says that he was put in the Garden of Eden to dress it, is a bad. And it means work, it means to serve, and in fact, slight variations of this word mean bondage or slave. And it's used another place in Genesis chapter 2 and in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was no man to till the ground. And the word that we translate till from is the same word that we translate keep from in uh, verse 15. Now, there's some inspired uh, commentary on this I'd like to share with you in the book Education on page 21 and paragraph 2. It says, To Adam and Eve was committed the care of the garden to dress it and to keep it, Genesis 2.15. 
Though rich in all that the owner of the universe could supply, they were not to be idle. Useful occupation was appointed them as a blessing to strengthen the body, to expand the mind, and to develop the character. Now, if in a sinless state they needed that at that time, how much more do we, who are sinful and degraded and immoral, how much more do we need something that will strengthen our body, expand our minds, and develop our characters? Well, we need work even more than they did. Continuing in the book now, Patriarchs and Prophets, and I've broken this slide up into four parts because it's a long paragraph, but it's on page 50 in paragraph number one. And it says, To the dwellers in Eden was committed the care of the garden to dress it and to keep it. Their occupation was not wearisome. Now, at that time, it wasn't wearisome. But later, after sin, remember God said, you will, you will eat your bread by the sweat of your brow. Their labor, which at one time had not been wearisome, would become and would be wearisome later, just like our work at times is wearisome. And, you know, if sometimes we, we try to devise ways to make our work easier, we produce machinery or, or mechanisms or if, even if you please, algorithms or protocols, the way we do our work to make it easier. And, and that, I'm sure, is fine and good in, in many respects. But if we think that our work is never going to be hard, is never going to cause us some discomfort or some perspiration, if you please, we probably are looking for a pie in the sky that doesn't exist in this earth right now. It's not God's will, friends, that all of our labor is easy. He expects us to labor and this is needful for us. It continues, it says, Their occupations were not wearisome, but pleasant and invigorating. God appointed labor as a blessing to man to occupy his mind, to strengthen his body, and to develop his faculties. And as we read in Education, page 21, that one of those things was his character. Continuing in Patriarchs and Prophets, it says, In mental and physical activity, Adam found one of the highest pleasures of his holy existence. And when, as a result of his disobedience, he was driven from his beautiful home and forced to struggle with a stubborn soil to gain his daily bread, that very labor, although widely different from his pleasant occupation in the garden, was a safeguard against temptation and a source of happiness. Now, when Adam left the garden, we're told here that he was forced to struggle with stubborn soil. If he thought his ground at that time was stubborn soil, what would he think today? When the Europeans came to the America, the, the, the America continent here, many of the fields had 12, 15, 20 inch deep topsoil layers. Today, most of the land has no topsoil left. It's all subsoil and fertilized and worked. And, and, and we think that that would have been great soil to have had 200, 300 years ago. But even it was, was probably nothing compared to what Adam had, and yet compared to the Garden of Eden, it was called stubborn soil. So I guess God knows that our characters, our bodies, and our intellectual faculties need to be strengthened even so much more than Adam's did, because our work is so much harder. It says, and when as a result of his disobedience, he was driven from his beautiful home, and forced to struggle with a stubborn soil to gain his daily bread, that very labor, although widely different from his present occupation in the garden, was a safeguard against temptation and a source of happiness. Beloved, there is something that is happy about working with the soil and, and tilling and cultivating the, the, the ground to produce produce. And it helps us. It's for our characters. It says, Continuing, those who regard work, now here we're talking about not just gardening, but work in generics. Those who regard work as a curse 
attended though it be with weariness and pain, are cherishing an error. You see, the work is not the curse. Idleness is the curse. We have work as a result of a curse, but the work has been designed to be a blessing to us. It says, the rich, the rich often look down with contempt upon the working classes. But this is wholly at variance with God's purpose in creating man. What are the possessions of even the most wealthy in comparison with the heritage given to the lordly Adam? Yet Adam was not to be idle. And friends, there are some of us, like maybe Sister Arlene, bless her heart, 96 years young, in her rocking chair today. She doesn't have too much she has to do. But most of us are not 96 years young like Sister Arlene. And we might have certain deficits. We may have certain illnesses. But work is helpful to us. Even some of the most sick need to learn to labor, even if it's just in minimal things, if nothing else, for their character development. But it will also help their physical faculties. It will help their mental abilities as well. And then finishing that paragraph in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 50, paragraph 1 again, it says, Our Creator, who understands what is for man's happiness, appoint, appointed Adam his work. The true joy of life is found only by the working men and women. The angels are diligent workers. They are the ministers of God to the children of men. The Creator has prepared no place for the stagnating practice of indolence. Some of you who know me fairly well know that my favorite president was Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, just so much about Theodore Roosevelt that I, I really liked. I, I was just sharing in a worship recently about um, actually a letter of, of one of his sons, his youngest son, Quentin, had written back to his fiancée in America. Quentin had went with his brothers to Europe for World War I. Quentin was an aviator. He was one of the first of the pilots. Uh, sadly, he was shot down and killed uh, by the Germans uh, during his time in the war, and uh, they respected him as the president's son so much that they actually gave him basically the equivalent of a state funeral, treated his body with respect. But he wrote back to his fiancée, who he never got to marry, and he told about the, the other guys who had tried to get him to go to the brothels, and he refused to do that. He said, you can't expect to treat women like animals. This is not right. And apparently one time they took him to a hotel under some auspice and, and he found out that it was not right and he just immediately left. And, and he told his fiance that, that his father had taught him to never dishonor his mother, to never dishonor his sister, to never dishonor women. And he said his father was the, the finest gentleman he ever knew. But Theodore Roosevelt was a hard worker. And you need to understand that when he was a young man, when he was very young, he had a, a bad case of asthma, and he wasn't very well. He was extremely nearsighted. He, he just couldn't see hardly anything. And, and for years, they didn't think he could learn because he couldn't see things, and they didn't realize he just couldn't see. He saw everything in a blur and just thought that's the way everyone else saw things. But finally, they realized that if he got some glasses, he could see better, and his father and mother, who doted upon him quite a bit, uh, they loved him. But one day his father just realized, all this is not helping our son. From now on, this stops. And from now on, this boy is going to follow what Theodore Roosevelt would later call the strenuous life. He was put to work and put to exercising and put to, to bring his body into subjection. Yeah, it reminds me of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, you know, that he was going to bring his body into subjection, least by any means he would become a castaway. And so even if we are somewhat sickly, we can become better by exercise and by work. And the best exercise is manual labor. It's manual labor. The Bible speaks about idleness with reproach. In Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 24, it speaks here and it says, A slothful man 
hideth his hand in his bosom, and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. Now notice it speaks about a slothful man. The translators of the King James used this term that, that meant lazy, and they used the term slothful, going back to the animal of the sloth. And a, a sloth, again, is that slow-moving, uh, hardly working creature representing laziness. Now, uh, another translation of this text says, instead of the slothful man, it says, the sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. In other words, he's saying that the man is so lazy, he puts his hand into the dish to get food, but won't even bring it to his mouth. He's so lazy. That's what the book of Proverbs says. In fact, we have several Proverbs here. In Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 4, it says, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. The slack hand or the lazy hand or the hand that won't work. He becomes poor. He has nothing to show for what he does. But the person who works diligently, he says, can become rich. Now, I find it interesting that many times people who truly are lazy, they like to make excuses for why they're lazy or why they're not working. And we see this also in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 13. In Proverbs 22, 13, it says, The slothful man, or the sluggard, saith, There is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. In other words, I can't go out because there's a lion out there. I could get slain. Bad things could happen to me. But it reminds me of a story. Two shoe salesmen were sent to a country in Africa from England. And when they got there, one of them cabled back to the company. And, and he said, no hope here. The people here do not wear shoes. There's just no hope. But the other salesman, he wired back and he said, wonderful opportunity here. There's no competition. You see, it's the same situation, but it was how they were approaching it. One was approaching it from a lazy, discouraged way. The other was from a hopeful, energetic way of putting himself into what he had. He said, there's a wonderful opportunity here. Well, if we go to the New Testament in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. It's Paul's writing here. He says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Now, he's speaking sort of in a seem seemingly generic fashion here. But notice what he says in the next verses, verses 10, uh, 8 through 10, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 8 through 10. He says, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power or not authority, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we command you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Now that's a pretty strong statement in some ways. But Paul is being very blunt here. He says, we had the authority, we had power over you. In the sense that we were providing you with spiritual food. But we didn't take the temporal from you. You know, the Bible says not to muzzle the ox that treadeth out the grain. Don't hold back that which is working for you. And Paul was working for them. But he says, as an example to you, we labored even night and day. I can imagine Paul working late into the night, mending or preparing tents for people so that he would not be chargeable to them for their substance. But he says, if people do not work, they shouldn't eat. Now, I realize that there are people who are old, people who are retired and not able to produce anymore. There are people who are disabled, and it is our responsibility to help those people. You know, um, we're told that we we'll always have the poor among us. There will always be those who need our help. But friends, if, if we are not those who need help, we should be working, we should be doing something productive 
to, to help ourselves and to help society is just as President John Kennedy said in his inaugural address. He said, don't ask what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. We should be mindful, looking around. What can I do to help my neighbor? What can I do to help my father, my mother, my brother, my sister? There's someone in my church, and they need their yard mowed, or they need their gutters cleaned, or, or, or maybe they just need some milk or soy milk or whatever, and they don't have it. We take it to them. We help them. We try to, to be productive. We try to be working and active. And this is especially true in matters of faith. In Hebrews chapter 6, if we could turn over to Hebrews 6, and notice verses 11 and 12. Hebrews 6, verses 11 and 12. And we desire that every one of you do shew the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, it's interesting. I looked up in my concordance the word lazy. And as best I saw, the word lazy is not in the King James Version of the Bible. The translators have used terms such as slothfulness, uh, sluggard in its place. But certainly the, the Bible condemns laziness. And it condemns laziness because God condemns laziness. God is an active individual, and he knows that we who are made in his image will be the happiest when we are active and progressive and productive. Idleness, discouraged by examples of industriousness such as the ant, in Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 8, he says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Go to the ant, you lazy one. Consider her ways, and be wise, which have no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. Now notice that here the wise man says, go to the ant. He doesn't say, go get a textbook. Doesn't say, go watch a video or a, a National Geographic special on the ant. He says, you go to the ant yourself and observe her ways. And I don't know if you've ever actually watched ants, went to an anthill and looked, or maybe you took a stick and, and probed into the anthill and then you saw a lot of action. But one thing you never see is an idle ant. The only idle ant I've ever seen was a dead ant. They are busy and they are industrious. And God tells you, he tells me, Yes, he tells you. I'm speaking to you. He says, go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. There are always too many people, someone said, who reach for the stool when it is the piano that needs to be moved. Did you get that? In other words, here's a job, and it's so easy to look for the easy part of the job and let someone else do the hard part of the job. But God doesn't want us to do that. Now, continuing here in this text in Proverbs, in verse 9 uh, through 11, he says, How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. I, I don't understand some of this newer generation very well. I have to admit, I, I don't comprehend a lot of it. But the idea that these young people can sleep till 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I don't understand it. A man said to his friend, he said one time, he says, my brother-in-law leaps out of bed as soon as the first rays of sun touch his window. And, and, and the friend said, well, that's, that's, just, that's just great. Well, the guy said, but of course, the problem is his bedroom faces the west. <laughs> Do you get it? His bedroom faces the West. The world is full of people, willing people, some willing to work and the rest willing to let them work. But let's look at a few more verses here from Proverbs before we close tonight. I know our time is almost up, but we can read these quickly. Proverbs ten twenty six, It says, As vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. 
you know, vinegar is, is, is abrasive to the teeth. It's not good. It's, it doesn't have a, a nice feel to your teeth. Smoke in the eyes, we know that that's a very uh, irritating thing. And says that's just the, the way it is when a, a sluggard is sent to do a job. In Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 24, it says, The hand of the diligent share, shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Again, contrasting those who work those who are diligent with those who are not. And then in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 4. Proverbs 13 verse 4. The soul of the slugger desireth and hath nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. And that's just a, a, an expression for the equivalent of prosperous in those times. To be made fat was to be made prosperous. Again, the sluggard may desire things, but he's not willing to work for it. He's not willing to work for. I've had people sometimes um, come to my house and ask for help. And if I, fought, if I felt like that they were um, sturdy and able to do things, I would say, yes, I'd like to help you. And I need something done over here to the side. I need this wood moved or I need a yard mowed. And if you can mow that for me, I will give you some money. I'll give you food and take care of you today. And uh, you, it's amazing how sometimes the people all of a sudden don't need so much as they thought they needed before. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 19, Proverbs 15, 19, it says, The way of the slothful man is as an edge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. Again, the contrast between the slothful and the righteous, indicating that the slothful are considered unrighteous. Now, that's Proverbs 15, 19. Now, we're going to take those and just reverse them and go to Proverbs 19, verse 15. Proverbs 19, verse 15. There we read, Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. It has been said that if there is no meal, no M-I-L-L, -L, no meal, there is no meal, M-E-A-L. Do you get the difference? Uh, the Farmer's Almanac one time wrote that the best place and time to pray for a good corn crop was when you were between the rows hoeing the corn. And a lot of truth in that, isn't there? But it's when we when we're not slothful, that we don't have to worry so much about hunger. But when we're slothful, hunger can be a problem. And then in the next proverb, Proverbs 20 and verse 4. See, it's a lot about this, in, in, especially in Proverbs. But there it says, The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. So sometimes in, in, in the plowing time, early in the spring, sometimes it's cold. And the sluggard says, well, it's just too cold to go out and do this today. But sometimes you need to do those kind of things. You need to work in adversity at times when you don't feel like working or when the conditions aren't the best because that's what needs to be done at that time in order to have a harvest or to have a success in what you're working at. And then finally, I'm going to close with uh, a text from Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and 18. But it says, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through. And friends, it is a fact that a house that is not occupied and maintained will be decaying and eventually fall in and fall through. And so our bodies are the house of God. Our bodies are, are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we are commanded to take care of them. And if we neglect that work through slothfulness, our bodies physically, mentally, emotionally, and most importantly, spiritually, will decay. So I have to examine myself because, you see, I have this natural propensity to laziness, and I have to overcome that. And as one proverb says, the uh, one learns to do the will of God by doing it. One learns to do the will of God by doing it. As I know what I should be doing, and turn my eyes toward being industrious in some way. It helps me in character. And it makes the next time that I need to hoe the garden or wash the car or uh, mow the yard or whatever it is, it makes the next time easier to do and more pleasant to do and happy to do. And so I just want to encourage you in this great character trait of being industrious.
and not being slothful. And I hope it's been a blessing to you. And may God bless you lots and lots and lots. Mm -hmm.